a number of you, and uh, it's been very interesting. I hope to meet more of you before the end tour. Uh, <clears throat> I brought along a few uh, pictures to look at. This is a site of our base over in England where the local people gave us a small plot of ground and we erected a memorial there with a chain across indicating the breaking of the European uh, Axis grip over Europe at the time. Uh, there are other pictures along the way. Uh, one, what it, looks, what it looks like when the paratroopers, who were also not neither one of us, but they played a very significant part in this conflict that we had back 75 years ago. And that's kind of what it looks like when they're coming down. Uh, a lot of a lot of brave men and all all kinds of situations. Uh, a series of pictures here of some of the activities that we uh, took place at the bases. <clears throat> I was with the uh, 388 Bomb Group, which was a part of the Eighth Air Force. Uh, we used to think that everybody in the world knew about the Eighth Air Force, but. I'm finding out now that uh, people say, what is that? <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a pretty powerful force, uh, made up of B-17s, uh, which was the plane that I spent my time with, uh, B-24s, B-51s, B-47s, fighter planes. Uh, they were also on the side of the people across the English Channel there. They had all their all their war equipment, including the uh, missiles, the V1s, the V2s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it was okay. <clears throat> including the uh, V1 rockets and uh, subsequently the V2 rockets. The uh, uh, V1s were just a small fighter plane. Uh, made up of a uh, single uh, fuel charge. You lit it like the lit a match and spit it on its target and it uh, went puttering off, almost sounded uh, somewhat like, even like a motorcycle. Put, 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 and you hear it coming at you. Uh, like we used to kind of make a joke at and flying so slow, it, there was one hang one hanger on the base. Someone would yell, "Open the hangar doors!" In case they wanted to fly through. <laughs> and they would go putting along and eventually run out of fuel, and they would stop. And we would hear the bang first, and we would time it to see how far away it was. At that time, I don't remember the. 642 feet per second or anyway we could determine how far away it was when it dropped later on they, they developed the v2 rocket and the first one people didn't even get a glimpse of it and didn't know what it was and what shape it was but the second or third one people got a view of that and described it as looking like a telephone pole coming in on London, particularly, that was the target. <coughs> and it was a much more powerful explosive. One of them went off very near General Eisenhower's quarters. Uh, there was a small park area, uh, just a concussion uh, of that single V2 rocket coming down left a, a mass of people that were in the park just left them laying dead on the, on the ground. It was just, just a concussion alone. But uh, other than that, we uh, also had, uh, oh, they had their airplanes, they would drop bombs and on whatever target they wished. Uh, our airfields, they would, and they would strafe our airfields occasionally, uh, particularly like to catch us in the morning when we were getting ready for a flight and had all our gasoline trucks out there camping off the gas fuel, fuel tanks and uh, a lot of the fuel tanks were open. We had, we had to hose it just like you have for your automobile, only a little larger. 
and we were using 100 octane gasoline, and uh, instead of chunks scraping, uh, smoothed the duck a little bit, uh, and got hit, so we take care of. But uh, there was all all the time you were kind of on your toes. We uh, I was ground crew, and I don't want to mislead anybody. I was ground crew on the Air Corps. Each of P-17 had a crew of 10 men, four officers and six enlisted men. And they had uh, 13 50 caliber machine guns on the plane. So when they went into combat, they would form it, take off from our base, and there were other bases around around our area, around and over England. They climbed the altitude and then head out over the channel uh, into Germany, primarily. France had declared uh, open cities so that France avoided, uh, avoided a lot of the bam bombings, in fact, most of the bombings, uh, as Manila did in the Philippines. I don't know if you're familiar with the open open city, but they basically <coughs> declared that they were giving up without a battle, without a fight, and thereby saving their cities and people and facilities from being bombed, but they turned over their government to the enemy, which are whoever that might be at the time. And <coughs> so the, most of the bombing took place over Germany and into Austria and some of the lower countries there. We did, we carried lots and lots of bombs. Missions would go and go up, uh, troops would come out, we would have our plane be tapping off the tanks in the morning as soon as daylight came. We did not have all the flashlights that we have in use today. Uh, initially, when we went over there, the best, the only night lighting we had in our tents, we lived in tents right within, like, as far away as our cars over here from our airplane. And <clears throat> so we had to wait till daylight to do most of the work. Plus, any light around your camp also became visible from the air. And the United States, I understand that in fact, in practice here too, but very forcefully enforced over there. Automobiles, everything was blacked out so that there was no visible light from above for the bomber to focus in on, from the, that is the enemy bombers. It was interesting time. Uh, a lot of London in particular took an awful lot of bombing. And, uh, but we made out, uh, <clears throat> the group, 388 bomb group, which was part of the Air Force, we flew 333 missions from our station 136 that Susan just mentioned uh, during the course of the war. Uh, Toward the end, uh, I believe nine of those were chow missions. We were flying rations, sea rations, or other rations that the military had at that time. Flying them over to the prison camps and dropping them just outside the prison camps. Uh, just like we dropped bombs previously. The first one were greeted. People were out there, ran out in the field, and grabbed the rations. And they were just, just delighted. And the next trip, trip came and came loaded with a lot of food again. And drove the flying over the airfield, and there they were all out waiting. They were going to catch these rations, which would have driven them into the ground if they did. But they uh, still had to fly dropped them away a little further away. And uh, that went on for, for a few days where we had to 
find different spots to drop them where they wouldn't be anxiously trying to get to the rations as soon as they hit the ground. The prisoners that we had over there were abandoned by the German guards uh, as, our, as our troops moved in close and as the end of the war approached, they were just, all of our prisoners were just abandoned in their, in their quarters. Most of, them, most of them were in pretty bad shape. Uh, but by that way, we did get some of them. On a few days after that, we were able to land in small airfields around there and unload. And in one instance, one of the prisoners sneaked aboard my particular plane in the squadron, the one that I serviced. And as he came back from that crew mission, out of the back door comes this rather thin, barely, almost barely alive individual in an enlisted man's heavy winter coat. And I came up to him and asked him where, how, where he came from. Well, he was Lieutenant so-and-so. He had uh, recognized the square H on the tail of our plane and knew that was his group. So if he got aboard that plane, they would get him back to his base, his base in England. And that, that's how it ended up. And he was kind of bewildered when he came out the back end of the, the back door of the plane. But I talked to him, kind of just to see and identify who he was, and took him into the tent to uh, sit down and lay down on a bunk for a crowd that they were, uh, give me a few minutes while we had to, after a mission, you have to kind of take your plane and check it out and see what uh, serious needs to be taken care of. He got a chief, took him into the mess hall, said he'd been dreaming of having a nice big steak dinner. Well, took him into the mess hall, and by then, by this time, it was almost 12 o'clock, and I talked to the cook, and he said, give me 20 minutes. 20 minutes, he came out with a steak that made this lieutenant, his eyes pop, steak, potatoes, vegetables, he sat down, I was across on him, and he sat a little bit, and he started eating away at the steak, and he was chewing, chewing away. <clears throat> he got the baby the second bite, maybe the third, and I noticed a little, he couldn't handle it. His teeth were uh, all loose, and uh, so I, I commented right away to him, recognized the situation. I said, you really don't have to eat it. Uh, glad to provide it, but you don't have to eat it. And uh, he kind of apologized that he couldn't. He had vision, I had vision this. He had this vision of what his meal was going to be, but he just couldn't handle it. Said the best, best meal that he did for the last year and a half he had been fish head soup, and uh, that was, anyway, I, I took him to the mess hall and to officer's quarters, and as soon as he walked in, a number of people recognized him, even though he was in the shape he was, and he was taken on from there to the medics, and I didn't have any more contact with him, but it was interesting to see him come back. <coughs> We were in our bombing uh, over, the, over the time that, we were, that I was there. We, uh, uh, the Army likes to name their battles. And uh, for each battle, the Army designs a special ribbon. And I'm not even sure what all those ribbons on my cap stand for. But I do know there is a yellow one that I have on another cap that indicates service prior to Pearl Harbor. But, uh, Anyway, some of the battles were the Rhine River and the, uh, the Ardin, Battle of Ardin, which is the official name, but better known as the Battle of the Bulge. And that was a 
crucial battle occurring right around just prior to Christmas time and almost within a few days of Christmas. Cold, overcast, our troops were pretty well surrounded, backed up against the English Channel and in bad shape. And we, as the Air Force, really couldn't get in to provide them help because of this so much heavy uh, cloud cover. And you can't go dropping, bo dropping bombs when you, you know your own troops are right nearby. So we had to kind of sweat, sweat out the weather. They also got word that they were pretty cold, their feet were cold. Uh, do you have any sheepskin boots? Well, we as ground crew people, we worked outside. We only had one hanger on the field and we never, never got into that. We always did, had to work outside. So we had sheepskin outfits with, with sheepskin boots. So when they wanted, when they, heard they had cold feet, we tied all their boots together pairs together and we trucked over around the perimeter of the airfield and all the people were throwing their sheepskin boots into the truck and within an hour or so they were being flown over and as soon as the weather well as soon as the weather cleared flew over and dropped all their boots on our guys uh, that were still over there fighting the battle it was uh, just the kind of support that you had for one another and other troops when they needed it. And there was an awful lot of trust and support and respect from one group to the other group. The, the air crew were very, very dependent on the reliability of the plane. They would get up there at 32,000 feet and they had flak and fighter planes and with the, the flak, which is basically hand grenades that are fired up and fired in when they get close to your plane. Poke holes through that little thin aluminum that, that the planes are made of. So here you have the plane with 10 guys in it, 32,000 feet up there. And all that's protecting them is that thin streak of aluminum and their 13 machine guns. And, uh, <coughs> It was a pretty gutsy battle to see these same crews get into a plane, go over there, be shot at. Some of them shot down. One of our early missions, before we had fighter escort, we lost one third of our planes in our crew, in our crew to the East Bond group. This is a, this is a heavy loss. Uh, but Next week, they had to get up and go again. And these same guys would come out, get in their planes and their replacement planes, and they would go into the battle again, just dropping bombs and fighting off German fighter planes and whatever else might come at them. There was a <coughs> rather, I often think of the shooting the school. If somebody wants a thrill, don't go after innocent children. Go after somebody else that's armed just like you. Give them a fair battle. That's a real thrill. I think that's the cure that we need to offer these people that are going around and shooting up our schools. Give them a chance to see. Face somebody else that has the same armor they have. Airplane art. Pilots like to have the Many of them had beautiful women painted on the side of their planes. Uh, and they were all uh, Monroe type, Marilyn Monroe type. They were uh, artists, uh, terrific artists. Uh, the guys in the service are over there, they're, you have a couple of thousand men on a base and maybe you have a dozen women. Uh, might be around there, I think a dozen is probably stretching it. But uh, often, you know, the troops with the uh, women are frequently on their mind. Salvation Army used to come out 
around the perimeter with their salvation army truck bringing coffee and donuts. And uh, for the woman drivers, just always, it's just always good to just see a woman. And they were always, they were always very nice to us. And, uh, and we used to sing a lot still. I was, uh, had been in, in the military band, and which was primarily a morale outfit, and uh, had a little background to that. But when we used to have to go a mile in from our tent or in our plane where we lived into the mess hall for our meals, three meals a day, we was right in on a sort of a train trailer. <clears throat> a lot of singing. Oh, I used to work in Chicago in a big, a big department store. And a woman came in with a hat one day. I asked her what kind she adored. Felt, she said, and felt she got. And I don't work there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that song has about uh, six or eight more verses to it. But uh, it was. Uh, Everybody, it, it boosted everybody up, you know, and uh, it was kind of fun. Uh, several planes, names on our planes. First one, one of our early ones, didn't even have a name. Uh, and that was painted, the first plane we had was painted. And we quickly, the higher ups in the air, the Army recognized that the paint wasn't really necessary on these planes. You didn't need to camouflage them up there in the air. Didn't mean anything. So anyway, that first plane did not have a name. But other names came in. Uh, replacements came in every time we lost one. Uh, new one would come in. Names like Sioux City Queen or Little Boy Blue or Snafu. Uh, <laughs> Gremlin Gus, most of you don't know what snafu means, but if you think it's annoying, you'll figure it out. Uh, last one we had was the worry bird, the ostrich we had buried in the sand. Uh, kept that till the end, and they flew home in that one within a few days after the war was over. Uh, one occasion, the plane my plane didn't come back. We always fly to watch the group as we came back to the mission. Shout out and look for your own plane to see if you got it. Your plane got in. Ours was missing. And uh, about two hours later, didn't come a couple of MPs. Where's Kyle? We're in your house arrest. Give me your 45. We always carried a 45 as a handgun. And he didn't tell me much more. And uh, so one guy stayed at the front door and one of them went around the back of the tent. <coughs> and I didn't know what it was all about. But I knew our plane was missing. Later found our plane had come back on one engine. And apparently somebody on the crew suspected that uh, there might have been some ground crew action that wasn't proper. <coughs> that there were fifth columns around there all the time and uh, uh, had to watch for them all the time. And particularly in the, in the native population around their airfield. They would frequently light a, light a haystack here and light a haystack here, light a haystack here. We'd see it. One light up, two light up. Within five minutes, you had three haystacks going, triangulating your field. And we knew that uh, that was for easy identification for enemy bomb bombers helped to light up their fields. I was under suspect because the plane had made it back from that mission on one engine. It lost one engine, two engines, three engines. It still flies, 
with one engine still functioning, but losing altitude all the way along. And uh, at that time, a fighter plane escorted it back across the English Channel. And it made it, almost made it across the Channel, so it got within sight of the, the England, the island of England. <coughs> Went down the water, and the crew was rescued. They indicated suspicion, and our crew was made up of Nowakowski, Strickland, Tarashenko, and Kyle. Who would you suspect? One of the Germans. I was being held politely, but. I was under suspicion. So about, they were there for maybe an hour and a half, then word came, number two engine, that was my engine, was the one that got him home. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine who he said was. <laughs> they gave me back my 45. <laughs> Of all those flights, I mentioned 333 flights, and uh, the last, the last uh, maybe 20 of them were like shell runs and prisoner runs and uh, a few rescue runs. But uh, at least 300 of them were uh, heavy flights. Out of those, and I mentioned the crews that would fly a mission place the fighter planes to shape the, 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 the other of them. Uh, I lose the words every once in a while, but these uh, blasts of, against the plane that rip the planes apart, rip the engines apart, mix the flesh of color, whatever, and knock the planes out of commission. And yet the plane, the crews would get back to, a few days later and go on another, another mission. And during all those missions, I only ran into one crew that panicked. And I, I only mention because of the tragedy that it caused just by panicking. Um, when, you're facing, when you're facing trouble, about the worst thing you can do is panic. When you're in a dire situation, don't panic. But this crew did. And, uh, we came back, <coughs> aborted their mission, came back, spotted their airfield, which was their home field, and didn't even bother lining up for a runway. They just came down and landed on the field, almost clipped the control tower ran through one of our tents that my buddies slept in and were sleeping in and just well they crashed then they crashed the plane on the end they landed on top of another Nissan hut where a couple other sergeants were had just gone in and I'd seen them go in that building just before then they, I was up uh, working on my plane, which was not on a mission that day. <clears throat> I slid down and quickly over there, counted them in as they came out the back end, the back door of the plane. I had a few unkind, uncouth remarks to make about the plane, what I could do with the plane. Uh, they went out running. And some of them had their parachutes dangling on them. And so I counted 10 men out and then went in through the plane and double checked just to make sure there was nobody else in there. And they went through the bomb bay and those, the pins had been pulled from all the bombs. Oh. Which, uh, which is something like setting the mouse trap to set the pin. Well, when the pins are pulled from a bomb, that means the little spinner on the tail end of the bomb can start spinning as soon as the bomb is dropped, and that basically arms the bomb. They're supposed to 
They're never supposed to bring the bombs back. They're never supposed to return the bombs. Once, once, and you don't pull the pin until you get across the channel. So, you know, they had run into combat. Well, I knew that. And, uh, but anyway, they took off and I looked over. Pretty sure the plane started to burn. I, my buddy was, had been in bed. The plane ripped his chair right away from me. <clears throat> One of the props caught him and tossed him 40 feet forward. And one other fellow in the tent was not touched, but he was totally out of it. And uh, so I looked the situation over, but the fellow wasn't hurt. Said, okay, go up there. By then, the crowd had started to gather, you know, 200, 300 yards away. Uh, he wouldn't go. So I had to walk him. I walked him halfway and said, okay. I turned around and started to go back. He started to follow me again. So I had to walk him all the way there and uh, got him up to the crowd and walked up there and said, thank you. And he did. And I started, started trotting back to the other fellow, my buddy that was there laying on the hard top back there. MD yelled at me to come back here and I stopped and turned around and looked at him and, and continued my continued on the way. <clears throat> but, uh, that whole incident was well, lost lost two men, saved two men. Lost one plane and saved one plane. So it was uh, kind of exciting. 20 minutes or so before the plane blew up. I, I managed to stick away as long as I could and get her every shot. All done, get done everything I could and everything blew. I was running for all I was worth to get away from it when the blast went and you know, I was tucked down to the ground just so tight and nice. It's almost like later when I was home, I, when I tucked the kids in at night, Tucked your blanket in around them tight. And that's the way I felt when I was being tucked in by that bomb. <clears throat> but interesting. The reflections and the thought. Snafu! <clears throat> <laughs> and I don't know what I'm like. I'm running out of town. Right. No, sir. Well, well let's hear about Aphrodite. Aphrodite? A special project, uh, Lieutenant came in the tent one night after dark. I would like to go on a special assignment. Well, what is it? Can't tell you. Secret. Where is it? Can't tell you. Secret. What does it involve? Can't tell you. Secret. Well, it turned out to be the Aphrodite project. Uh, Aphrodite project. He probably brought us along. I think that's what Aphrodite means. <laughs> it was a program where I was volunteering for it anyway. Uh, you know, those people that are in the army know what it means to be volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> so we went in the middle of the night driven off to some place that we didn't know where we were going. Just pack your bag and you're going. How long? We don't know. Uh, but there were a whole field, airfield was set aside for this project. We had uh, B-17s and we, the basic program was to create, to make the troop B-17s, one a baby ship and one a mother ship if we identified them. The baby ship had a television projector in the nose of it and the mother ship had a television receiver up here. And the mother ship had a little control mechanism about the size of a cigar box with nine little steps in it and one 
control stick uh, about the size of a long cigarette where you can control the flight mechanism. The baby ship, we, uh, before they were loaded, my, my job over there was to get the baby ship in a condition where the throttles could, the, for the four engines could be clamped and moved in the, within this range and still keep equal thrust on both sides of the plane. And so it requires a little bit of, uh, a little ingenuity, a little bit of, I, I had, was one of the few that knew anything about the Stromberg carburetor on the airplane. So I had to work with that and the linkage and like to get, to get this achievement. I would do some of it on the groundwork and then I would fly with a pilot uh, to finish up and see, fine tune my work. The plane after that was then loaded with what we called RDX, which was seven times the power of dynamite. And it was loaded. Well, first of all, all the guns and all the armor were taken off the baby ship. And boxes and boxes of RDX were loaded all the way from the tail right up to into the plexiglass nose of the plane. Uh, one seat was left in the plane for the pilot. Uh, when the plane took off, two people took it off, but the second fan had to sit on these boxes, one of the boxes or two or three of these boxes of, of dynamite. And the object was to fly this baby ship into a target, uh, like the submarine targets being the submarine pins over there, the sub submarine pins, which would be cement gates. Uh, also, the barriers on the Maginot and the Fiji battle lines where the French and English had set up, set up heavy uh, armor and facing each other on their border between France and Germany. And that had taken years of tunnels and all the heavy armor. So we were trying to, we had to blast through this barrier area so that our tanks could get through those make gates for our tank, basically. <clears throat> At takeoff time, uh, I would, again, have to volunteer to go out and pre-flight the plane after it was all loaded with dynamite and dynamite and fused from one end to the other with all this uh, bright yellow cabling you've ever seen fusing to dynamite. Anyway, I would take a jeep out to the plane that was going to be taking off. The rest of the base would be in a bunker way off in the back, off the edge of the field. I would go out and pre-flight the plane, which is basically you run it through its uh, all its op functions to make sure every everything is working, all the all the, the flaps of the, the rudders, and the elevators, and all that sort of stuff, and all the engines in particular. I have to watch the gate to make sure all the engines run up to full power. After I had pre flight the plane, then I would get out, ride back to the bunker, and two people would come out and take the plane off. Uh, they would fly to altitude, and the mothership would take off with them and fly with them, or just above them, keep track of them. The object being to get out or reach altitude over England while they're flying over England for the two people in the baby ship to bail out over England and the mother ship to take over and fly the baby ship into a target, predetermined target. Uh, <coughs> at, uh, uh, and the Navy was also in on this program with us. They had one plane on the field, we had seven. Uh, but uh, you know, ours went off fairly well. The full program was not successful, I'm sorry to say. But uh, uh, we lost one plane in the clouds, and never did hear about that. Uh, one of them landed, we had impact fuses, supposed to ignite the dynamite charge in the 
and with the, the baby plane landed, it made such a smooth landing that it didn't jar the impact field. The plane didn't blow up. <coughs> had to call it another plane to go in and bomb it. And told them, bomb that plane down there, but don't get too close to it. <laughs> the one that blew in the air? Is yeah. that Joseph Kennedy? Yes, that was, uh, that was the last flight. Yeah, they flew their Navy plane. They flew their Navy plane, and Joe Kennedy and his companion. I don't, I don't know who flew with him, but the two of them took off. And Joe Kennedy was a pilot, and they took off and got up to altitude, and they had the same setup to be the plane, the mother plane. And at the point where the baby plane threw the switch to threw control, full control of the baby to the mother, the plane blew up. And that was over England. And, uh, well, it was, uh, it was out of sight, but not out of sound. And, uh, and we knew who was in it. Uh, shortly after flight, after the flight, we knew who was in it. And it was, uh, the program was terminated after that. Joe's father was ambassador to England at the time. And Joe, we understood, was the Kennedy boy, the oldest Kennedy boy that was being groomed to be president of the United States. Actually, the public, very few, for years, that, that program, that actual program, was not uh, publicized. Uh, when did you hear about it? Who, who asked about that every night? When did you hear about it? Do you know about the time? And I don't care what sort, I just want time right. I, I, I uh, read about it about 20 years ago. Okay. And, and it just stuck in my mind. Yeah. yeah. We have another question right here. Yeah. Uh, did you work on the Memphis Bell? And is also, is it true that uh, when they flew 25 missions, they were allowed to come home then? I did not work on the Memphis Bell, but that was the pattern on our field. Uh, the, pa the pilots would fly. 25 missions would be rotated home for a 30 day leave. And, uh, the bell was in uh, England, wasn't it? I couldn't tell you. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, we didn't We didn't get a whole lot. Information was not passed around a whole lot. Uh, even when our plane took off on a mission, we never knew where it was going. Yeah. We only knew how by the amount of gas we put in the tanks, we knew how deep the mission might have been. But that's the only clue that we had. And even then, we didn't talk about that. But we knew ourselves how much gas we were putting in. But uh, we did not know the destination of the flight until after it was over. In fact, the crews, the, before the mission, um, the enlisted men crew, five of them would pretty regularly come into my tent and I would go in uh, and because I knew that's what they wanted to do. So the crew would come in to my tent and I would be in there and we would have a few words before they, before they took off on their mission. Uh, they would frequently toss their wallets on my bunk. Uh, they weren't supposed to do that. They were supposed to leave their wallets and identification information back in the briefing room. But it was a long process to get it back again and all this sort of stuff. And it was much easier if they just tossed it by my bunk. And uh, when they would leave, I would put them in my pocket and I would carry them for the rest of the day until the mission returned. When the mission returned, I would first do the first the Two things you had to do to secure the plane is after it lands. And then I would go in the tent, back in my tent, I had tossed four or five wallets on my bike, 
and they would come in, pick up their wallet, and get on their way. It was just kind of a quiet, uh, I guess, quiet, respectful uh, process that we went through. No, but I did not know the Memphis Ballot. So, thank you, Mr. Kyle. Thank we you. will entertain more questions, and now we'll hear from Bill Goff. Thank you. The um, Marine Corps experience. And the reason why we I, I like this, the two different presenters, Mr. Kyle was in the Air Force, so he wasn't in a direct combat situation. He didn't have face-to-face -face combat with the enemy. Gosh did. So you'll see two different perspectives on a very, very um, horrible war. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> well, I made four operations in the Marine Corps. Bougainville, Emeru, Guam, and Okinawa. They're all islands. I was on Guadalcanal. It had been occupied, but we used Guadalcanal as a reserve training area. Every time we go on an operation, come back to Guadalcanal, back to Guadalcanal, back to Guadalcanal. Think about Guadalcanal. <clears throat> there had to be there had to be a thousand coconut trees. <laughs> they must have raised coconut trees. They planted them all in rows, like we would plant apple trees or pear trees or anything like that to grow coconuts, I suppose, professionally. The thing that I remember the most about Guadalcanal, we had a what they call a slit trench. Now it's a little narrow trench you look out of the area and that's where you defecate. They had a, a bag of uh, lime there and a, 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 a cup and you dunk lime on the defecation and go away. Well one time we were up there and out come this monitor lizard. Well, they're just like a big alligator. <laughs> I mean, this thing had to weigh 200 pounds. He'd stick his tongue out like that. And here I am, just finished. <laughs> this thing comes up and he saw me and I saw him. There was another fellow with me up there, it didn't matter. And we grabbed a palm frond and chased him. Well, we didn't go maybe 10, 15 feet, and he went back in the boondocks, and that was the end of that, but I'll never, I'll never his mouth was that big. Just, uh, God, wasn't it? And he had red crabs on Guadalcanal. Red crabs are about that big around with the feet and the things on them. There had to be a million of them. And they're all going in the same direction, coming up out of the ocean, all going up in the same, you had to shuffle along your feet like this or you'd step on the dumb things. And I'll never forget the red crabs. One night I was on guard duty, someplace, God knows where, on the <coughs> Guadalcanal, along come a horse, with an older horse, clop, 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 clop. And he stopped in front of me, I took my belt off and put it around his neck, and when my uh, time was over, why I led him back into the camp, and there were the guys from Texas there, and they made a saddle for him, and a harness for him, and everything, we rode a horse around. It didn't go fast, but this is clunk clunk. I'll never forget the horse in Well Canal. From there, we went to Bougainville. We landed as Re, not reemplacements, reinforcements. The enemy was on Bougainville, the Long Island, kind of like a cigar. And they had a submarine base over on the other side of the island. And I think it was the 4th Marine Division that was occupying the Japanese on that side of the island. We came in on this side of the island as reserves, and if necessary, we could advance. In Bougainville, we had what we call a three-man fire team. One guy carried a BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle. Another guy carried a Thompson submachine gun. And the third guy carried an M1 rifle. 
Well, you're in the jungle, and you couldn't see from me to you any place in this city jungle with all the trees and the vines and the leaves and God knows it was, oh God, hello please. But there was parrots flying all over the place. The parrots flew around on Bougainville like the sparrows fly around here. Well, I took my Thompson submachine gun and tried to shoot the parrots. I never hit any of them, but <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot of fun doing it. So much for, oh, I see it says got, I got earthquake. You ever been in an earthquake? Well, here we are in the middle, out in the middle of the jungle and everything starts shaking. It only lasted maybe oh, 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds, I don't know, not a very short period of time. But Jesus, all the vines and the leaves and limbs are all falling down. You can't go any place because there's no place to go. And he used to, everything was shaking. I'll never forget the experience. Bougainville. Oh, we landed on there, and there was no no gunfire, no bombs, or no nothing. We just landed as reserve troops to advance if we had to onto the other side of it. Who comes out of the boondocks? A man and a woman. The man on his penis, he's got a cowrie shell. I don't know if any of you know what a cowrie shell is. It's kind of a little shell like that. He had that thing clamped on there. <laughs> <laughs> and a woman come out and she had a piece of vine around her waist and a leaf hanging down in front of me. <laughs> the first time I ever saw a lady without any dress on. <laughs> <laughs> they stood there for 10, 15 seconds, I don't know, give or take. We stood there looking at them. And they turned around, went back in the jungle, and that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then we went to Emeru. Emeru is a small island about the size of Grand Island, and there was nobody on it. They didn't, when we landed, we didn't know that, but we didn't bomb it or anything like that. We just landed and had no opposition. I got a battle star for it, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> they had grasshoppers there. The grasshoppers had to be that big. I never, you can't imagine. Big things, and we'd stick a twig in and they'd snap on that thing, and big grasshoppers. And they had black beetles about that big around, about the size of a half a tennis ball. Never forget them things. We only stayed there for a couple of weeks. Wandered around, there's nothing to do. <laughs> Back to Guadalcanal we went. <laughs> then we went on the way to, we left Guadalcanal on the way to go to Guam. We landed on an island called Ulithi. It was just a, like that. I don't know, maybe, maybe almost where you could see the top of the island. No trees, no, no, just big sand. We went swimming there, and in the bottom of the ocean, there's crabs, big, big crabs. I mean, that big around, huge, big crabs. There was a, so we found a piece of wood, and we stuck it in its jaws, and he clamped on it, and we lifted him out of the water. One of the guys was carrying a machete, Machete's a knife about that long. We stuck it in there and cut the adductor muscles and opened up the crab and then we had to go back on board ship and we left the crab laying there. So that was you lit the back to Guadalcanal. And we <laughs> took patrols on Guadalcanal and practiced this, that, and the other thing. Then we went to Guam. Guam was another experience, let me tell you. I never, the whole, whole horizon, you can see when you're standing on the edge of a beach, you can see about eight miles out into the ocean. It was just covered with battleships and cruisers <coughs> and <coughs> destroyers, all kinds of landing craft, all kinds of vessels. 
and kamikazes. I saw a kamikaze zoom right into a battleship. Boom. Or it may have been a cruiser. I don't know what the hell kind of boat it was. Big boat. Kamikaze. And we watched the. Uh, we're coming on. on uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. We come in on a landing craft. And you, while we're out in the ocean coming ashore, why you got nothing to do but look around and see everything. And all this is going on while we're in the operation of landing on the island. <clears throat> uh, aircraft firing at each other and tracers blowing up. Uh, every, I think every fifth round of a anti-aircraft gun is a tracer so the, the gun operator can tell where his bullets are going. And the sky is red with tracers. So he comes to shore, and I'm talking with some guy. I have no idea who he was. Now it was the front of the boat. And he jumps off down to the water, water knee deep, maybe up to your thigh or something like that. I don't know how long people work on that. And I looked over this other guy, and here he is, laying face down in the water. I just kept on going to shore. We get on shore, the sand comes up, and then the trees start coming up. We call it a hummock. And I'm coming up, and I can't get through the hummock because it's so dense. So I start running down the in the sand. You can't run very fast in the sand, but I was kind of trotting, I guess. And all of a sudden, voice says, stop. One time. And I stopped. And I looked down, and here's a Nambu, it's a Japanese machine gun, a Nambu bullets. They're going right across in front of me. A foot, 18 inches far in front of me. If I had taken another step, I wouldn't be here tonight. I said, thank you, God. Hmm. With that, I went up to the hummock, sat down, and I prayed. Two, three minutes, I don't know. With that, I turned around, went on to the advance of the, made contact with the enemy. Mom had rats. God, you never saw so many rats in your life. And they'd get in your elbows and in your crotch and on the back of your knees at night. And they'd go to sleep there while you'd shake them off. That was the rats. I don't think they got any more rats there now because they got brown tree snakes over there. Brown tree snake is probably, oh, six foot long, <coughs> that big around, and they'll eat the racks. I don't know, that's happened since I was there, since I was told that. <coughs> that was Guam. Oh, another little experience on Guam. I was a PFC in the Marine Corps. You don't know too much of the PFC. But the lieutenant, we're up out in the middle of the island, doesn't matter. The lieutenant says, men, come on over here, I want to talk to you. So we get around over there, he says, everyone with a high school education, step forward. I step forward as I graduated in 1942, North Carolina High School. The other guy stepped forward, he had red hair, and I had red hair at the time. The guy's name was Kavner. He says, Kavner, what about you? He says, I had one semester at UCLA. He says, Kavner, pack up your gear, you're going to Quantico, Virginia to officer's training school. 
Perhaps you can step back and rise. <laughs> and I step back and line. Another If we get Ben out of Guam, we got back on, on, on Bell Canal again. The guy named was Perigno. He was Italian from New York City. He says, and I'm going to use a vernacular. He says, fuck this shit. He says, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> he says, like hell you are. He says, you watch. <laughs> He went away someplace. 20 minutes later, <coughs> along come a jeep. He loaded his gear on. He was 16 years old. <laughs> <laughs> went through Guam. Regno. So a guy and they played poker over there. Didn't have much money, but we used cigarettes or whatever he had to spend. One guy, his name was Dow. You've heard of Dow Chemical. His name was Dow. He lost an aeroplane playing poker. <laughs> <laughs> he had a picture of an aeroplane, and he put that on the table, and the guy's accepted as part of the gambling playing poker. He could afford it, I guess. <laughs> Um, Okinawa, that was a biggie. We landed at Yantan Airfield, which is the southern part of Okinawa. Nobody's there. We're all ready for combat. Run up, up the landing craft and up onto the, got onto the airfield, not a soul around. <coughs> so we kept on advancing. We turned, as I remember, we turned toward the left and started going up to the hills, oh, maybe a mile, mile and a half away. And he started shooting at us. Well, then things got a little thick. I didn't have any contact with him. I didn't shoot at anybody at that point in time, at least my memory serves. We kept on advancing. We got into a little village, someplace or other, God knows where. A little store. It wasn't, maybe near the end or something like that, a little bit. But it had women's kimonos in it. Beautiful silk kimonos. The obis and all the stuff that they wear with them. Beautiful things. And I found a suitcase. Nice. And so they're silk. Well, you know, you girls in particular, you know how you can push silk together. I mean, it makes a pretty small bundle. I packed this suitcase full of kimonos. I was hoping to bring them home, put them on my backpack. All of a sudden, mortar shells. Are coming toward us, and we could, you could hear them bump, bump, bump. We could see the pattern coming right toward us. And we said we better get the. We were in some kind of a farmhouse or something or other. So we better get the hell out of here. So we got out. <coughs> Jeez, I forgot my kimonos. <laughs> <laughs> we went on up the hill. Got around. I kind of got separated from the other guys. I don't know how it wasn't far. But all of a sudden, out comes a Japanese soldier. Bingo. And then went off down the hill someplace. Well, I didn't hang around because I didn't know how many more, and I was kind of alone. And so I. Man, I got up with the other guys, and we got kept on getting the heck out of there. That was that experience.
guys ever hear of a, you know what a cricket, the tour people, the little crickets that you had when you was a kid? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember the little things that you click, 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 click? Yeah. They gave us these clickers. We had to go from, uh, when you're in combat, control of hills is kind of important, apparently. I can see why. They gave us these little clickers and we moved from one hill to another, but you had to move at night or you were exposed. So under a nightfall, why they let us cross from one hill to another with these clickers. Each guy had a clicker so he, he could orient himself in the procession of where we were going. Clickers. They threw the damn thing away. I guess I should have kept them. Another night, we've got a foxhole someplace, God knows where. At night, it's dark, it's black. You get a white cigarette lit up. Cigarette uh, every 30 seconds or something like that. I don't know. Bingo. Next morning, we go out and there's feet are sticking out of the. We didn't smoke anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Killed a woman soldier. I say she was a soldier. She had a military hat on. It was probably it had an anchor on the front. I still got it at home, someplace, man. I don't know where it is. It had an anchor on the front of it and had things that put down. You assume was a fur with a knob on the top of it. She was running the. She wasn't running, she was walking, I guess, across a rice paddy. And we're here in this shanty. Do you ever see that brings to mind the ducks? Geese. You get a goose mad at you, boy, and they come at you with her wings all like this and hissing and, oh, geez, then there were three, four geese on this place. We had to chase them out of the place because they kept trying to attack us. Anyhow, at dusk this one night, the person is running across the right bay. I could see, oh, I say he, I could see he was carrying a rifle. You could see it. Bingo. <laughs> Went out there the next morning and it's a woman. She had this hat on. So I took her hat, so she ain't gonna need that anymore. <laughs> Had still home someplace. Turned down a Purple Heart. I hear I'm a kid, 19 years old. You don't know much. You think you know a lot, but you don't. We're on this rice paddy, and the place is full of rice paddies all over the place. And I'm kneeling down one knee. And the other knee is up like this. All of a sudden, zoom, down comes on a piece of shrapnel. Lands on my, it was just like somebody hit me on a baseball bat on my thigh. And I brushed it off real quick. And a corpsman come along. I don't know where he came from. He said, you all right? He says, you got hit. I says, I know it. I says, I don't know if I'm all right or not. I haven't tried to stand up. <laughs> well, he says, you was hit by enemy fire. You want a purple heart. I said, no, nah. I said, give it to somebody else that deserves it. <coughs> I wish I'd taken it out because I guess you get money for him. <laughs> <laughs> shortly after that, we had a flamethrower with us. Boy, you ought to see something. Them flame guys got two cylinders on his back with a flamethrower. You ought to see the fire that them flamethrowers throw. Wow. <coughs> First I'd ever seen one. We're 
מגנים. Close to Naha. Naha was the city of, the capital city of Okinawa. It was about as flat as this table when we were there. <coughs> I've talked to people since then, it's built on But we're on a rice paddy overlooking Naha. The rice paddy down below us, kind of like this. And we're up here, the rice paddy. All of a sudden, a flare goes up, way off in the distance someplace. Zoom. Lit the whole place up, just like day. And I look, there's nine Japanese soldiers. When the flare went up, they all dropped to one knee. They were probably, oh, 35, 50 feet in front of me kind of off on the one side a little bit. They all dropped to one knee, all, all instantly. <coughs> well, I was carrying a BAR at the time. <laughs> Put a new clip in, a couple more. And the flare went out. And all of a sudden, you know what a very pistol is? Yeah. No. Years ago, years before communicating on boats, men carried a very pistol. Well, if you're out on the lake or the ocean or someplace else, and you hear some other sound someplace, you shoot your very pistol up. It's like a 12 gauge shotgun shell, only it's got a flare in it red flare. You shoot it off, don't let the other guy know where you're at in your boat. Well, the first guy in this line had a very pistol right over the top of my head. Oh. Shot. Six inches, eight inches, foot, I don't know, but I can see this thing today coming right out, right over. There. Give him a little more. <laughs> That was it. I was going to bring the very pistol home, but one of my bullets went through the stock of the very pistol, the pistol grip, went right through the pistol grip, and the thing was all shattered, and I said, well, there's no sense taking that home. So I left it there. With well, that way, I guess that kind of wound up the operation. We had free well occupied Okinawa at that point in time. <coughs> Step back from board ship and I got yellow jaundice. Yeah. You know what yellow jaundice is? Redness. Your feces are about the size of deer turds. <laughs> Your urine is like coffee and you turn about as yellow as that piece of paper. Yellow jaundice. We got back on Guadalcanal and that boy, all they gave us was ice cream. <laughs> boy. <laughs> Six times a day, we got ice cream. Oh, oh. And the doctor told me, and I never, he says, Billy says, don't ever get flood. He says, you'll carry that virus for the rest of your life. And I guess I got yellow Jonas virus in me yet, I don't know. But anyhow, I came back to the mainland and up to Klamath Falls and was discharged at that. I was cleared of the jaundice. <coughs> I was discharged from the military. So that's the essence of my experience overseas. I'd go back in the Marine Corps in a minute if I had to. They won't take me anymore because they can hardly walk. <laughs> I have a question for you. We've heard from Mr. Kyle about one of the most famous people that he served with, Joseph Kennedy. Who's a well-known Marine that he served with? Oh, Chesty Puller. Oh. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Chesty Puller. Oh, yeah. He was a short man. He wasn't a tall man, but he had a 
barrel chest. They call it chestically with a colonel in the Marine Corps. We were on Guadalcanal. He says, hey, you come on over here. I went over. Yeah, I helped him chop down one of the one of the uh, palm trees. And we used the palm tree. They set up a theater out there and he used the logs from the palm tree to sit on to watch the movie theater. Chesty Fuller, I haven't had worked with him for, well, I don't know, 8, 10, 15 minutes. I don't know how long it took to cut this dizzy tree down. They cut easy. They're kind of grainy wood. They cut kind of easy. Chesty Fuller, then somebody called him and he left and that was that. My experience with Chesty Fuller. Any other questions? Yeah. I, look, <clears throat> I look to know where both you guys were exactly when the war ended. Well, the canal. <laughs> <laughs> and? London. In London. Yes. Well, it took a day or two before you realized what happened, and that then, or was a reserved celebration, or was immediate, or rumors? We, did you believe it? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> we were on Guadalcanal when they had D-Day. Well, <laughs> what's D-Day? We we had no idea of the, the battle in Europe. We weren't physically involved in it and had no communication. You didn't have radios or pocket radios. You had nothing like this. Everybody come word of mouth or whatever it was. <coughs> and you were in London. No, it was London. Uh, the command. And the rumor was going through the country, you know, through the troops uh, several days ahead of time. So people had gathered massively in London. I think all the people in, in England had gathered had come to London. They were dancing in the streets and snake dancing for uh, two blocks long. Anybody that could play any kind of a little squeeze box or a highland yeah. or anything that made music along the streets, the taxis and buses were all stopped. They couldn't, they couldn't move because of all the people. And uh, the subways, the underground, as they call them, were still running. But uh, the people were just so happy and everybody singing and just uh, never, saw it, never saw such a big crowd. And coming by Buckingham Palace, I didn't get to Buckingham Palace at the time. <coughs> but, the people and the English people have a great respect for the king and the queen. And at an emotional time, they gather in front of Buckingham Palace and uh, periodically the, a member of the family, royal family, will come out and give the royal wave. And sometimes they have two or three, and sometimes the whole family. But, uh, and the, the royal family stayed right in Buckingham Palace right through the war as a part of the contribution to the morale of the place and uh, also there was a kind of an unspoken uh, respect on the two sides. The, the, the Germans did not intentionally bomb Buckingham Palace or the St. James Cathedral. They did hit that cathedral one corner at one time accidentally and they apologized. But uh, there was, there was great excitement and great relief for everybody. For everybody. <coughs> Your question, I, sir? Oh uh, yeah. You're talking about the end of the war. I kinda wanted to know what the atmosphere was in North Tanawanda before you guys <coughs> went nineteen years old and you got in. And how about all the guys? Did you know the guys that went over and they came back and you got like Sil Dan and Pat DePaulo and Jimmy O'Donnell? I knew Charlie Pacini. Did you ever hear of Charlie Pacini? Yeah, yeah. I knew Charlie football. Pacini. He was in the Marine Corps. He was a good football player. You bet he was. Well, but he shot himself. Did you know himself. those guys that <laughs> when you were 19? He had a carbine. What was your attitude of football? Uh, Charlie Buster? shot himself. <laughs> right between the toes. <laughs> his toes are like this. The boy, it was an accident, but right so right between his toes, he went over the sick bay and they 
put a band-aid on either toe and that was the end of that. Did you guys, <laughs> did, did you, well. did you guys want to go over and beat them guys up a lot? Did you just, you were it was war. What was it was a violent war. Uh, North Taiwan had kids. A lot of North Taiwan kids went, my, my brother, my older brother, and he didn't even get him a graduate out of high school. He, he, he didn't make graduation service. Over and jumped in times behind enemy lines. It was paratroopers. How was the attitude of those guys? Uh, Sil Dan told us a story about... Civil Dan, I knew him too. He, uh, he was in the cockpit, they got <coughs> shot down. He had to jump out of the plane. He was in the gunners because he's a little guy. He jumped out, he was supposed to count to 10 before he pulled up. Fair. He says, I went one, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> I says, how did the Germans treat you when they landed? He says, oh, they loved us. They welcomed us with open arms. Come on. I mean, he was all kidding about it. What was the attitude of North Carolina guys? There was a ton of them. It was a war. We had Pearl Harbor, and the president put all the Japanese in, what would they call them, internment camps? Mm -hmm. Well, the feeling at that time against the Japanese was intense because of their act of Pearl Harbor. And I can understand at that time what he put, and, the Jap and I guess the Japanese are like anything, anybody else, the English or the Polish or the Chinese or the Germans, we're all kind of clannish in our own right. Be us what we may, where were we? At? And the Orientals in particular are a little more clannish than the rest of us. And I could understand at that time why Roosevelt put these Japanese people in internment camps for fear of their committing more acts of violence, spying or be it what it may, in the United States. I think he did the right thing at the time. And subsequently, I spent a lot of time in Honolulu. Subsequently, one of the senators from Honolulu passed a law or a rule that these Orientals, the Chinese be, or Japanese be reimbursed for their time in these <clears throat> internment camps. It goes back quite a few years, but it, I forgot the guy's name, the senator, where we were, it doesn't matter. Any but other I, questions? I, I'm sorry. I have one for Bill. Um, I read a story a few months ago about a soldier named Desmond Doss who served in the Battle of Hacksaw Ridge. Um, did you ever meet him or any of the soldiers that took place during that battle? No. And you didn't get to know too many guys. You would be shifted around. Mm -hmm. you know. I had one fella that I got to know pretty well. His name was Bob Farr, F-A-R-R. -R. He was from Everett, Washington. But he was a bum. <laughs> By this I mean, he was a young man like myself, but he rode the rails. He traveled around the country on the rail, on the railroads. He, we call him a bum. He's actually, he knew a hell of a lot more than I do about how to live. <laughs> Bob Farr. And he worked in the mess hall so he wouldn't have to go on guard duty. <laughs> so along come the horse. Bob Farr's got big cans of oatmeal. They, they, the mess hall, they had cans so probably three foot square for the troops filled with oatmeal in the morning. Well, Bob Farr gets the cans of oatmeal and take them over and give them a horse to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any other questions? Yes, sir. I just have a comment. Uh, thank you both for this. Uh, it means so much for, to all of us from North Tonawanda. Uh, my dad, all his brothers, all my uncles from my mom's side fought, but didn't want to talk about it. And I understand that. Um, <clears throat> you both are so impressive, not only for your hearts, but your minds are so clear and the remembrance you have is just amazing. And uh, thank you. Thank you both.
guys, we didn't talk about the, the war until maybe 10 years ago at the most. And I spent a lot of time talking to Mr. Kyle. And according to his family, he never talked about it much either. But both of them have shared with me just harrowing stories, which they didn't talk about tonight. Um, so when they say that war was gruesome, it was gruesome. And that's only what I know and what we know from books and TV shows and movies, etc. So I'd just like to read something to you that was um, written about in, the, in this book that we received here at the museum. And the title is, In the Attack. All the planning and maneuvering in the world, all the artillery and air bombardment possible, all the training absorbed and all the inherent bravery a man can possess always comes down to a moment of truth. To achieve victory on any battlefield in all of history, one side or the other has to get up and go, has to attack, has to close with the enemy, has to kill enemy soldiers or send them fleeing, has to prevail, has to take possession of the enemy's defensive works or his camp, town, city, or countryside. So there was a compelling reason for all this. And as I said, when we started, it's for our freedom and the freedom that we enjoy today. So I just wanna thank both of them for their service and also for their time coming out tonight. And thank all of you for coming out to hear the presentation. No, I just wanted to show this folks. This is my dad's. He got this in 1940. And he was in the uh, army. Oh, the PMT. Well, that's what I was. Yeah. And, he, you know, I have a hat and stuff. And I just wanted to bring it to show you guys. You said you were had some remembrance. but uh, And I also have a medal. One of my uncles um, was in four different engagements. You know, so, we <laughs> used to call these things. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see the picture from here, but uh, Can you show that to me? Or gave it to me to copy? Oh. Sir. <coughs> Do you have any um, parting advice for all of us here tonight? And we know that, you know, sometimes war still happens and sometimes uh, even if it's smaller, it can be just as bad. What would you say to all of us who still see bad news around the world? How do you think? Well, you know, today we had a, another terrible, terrible, terrible experience. What in God's name is happening to our community? And this one, we had one in Buffalo a week ago. This one was in Texas. They, what in God's name is wrong? I can't figure it out. Well, there's something, something not right. It ain't the normal way people behave. I suggested to Susan on the way over that there are so many comments that I don't hear any remedy. I suggested one that we identify these people ahead of time. And I think they're look, just looking for a thrill. And their thrill could be much greater if instead of attacking innocent school kids, if they face somebody else with <coughs> the same armor and offensive weapons that they had, let them have a showdown. That's a real thrill for them. Why don't we offer them that instead of offering them 
a classroom full of six, seven year old kids. Let them go in the military like you guys did. No. That's what makes me that make that proposal. A little late after they did So good luck to those in the Ukraine, for example. Right. Yeah. 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 A lot of respect to those people. Are you the fellow was in Vietnam? Me? No. With a hat on? No, no. That's Justin Bigger. Huh? From Sanborn. He's too young. 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 No, no. I'm the historian for the town of Greenfield, and I missed a lot of this because I had to go to another job. You missed the full list. No. You were here two weeks ago, weren't you? Okay. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. No, I remember when the Berlin Wall fell and when the Summer Park Mall actually had people in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it.